Welcome to another episode of Wine 101 on the Road. This series um, is in southern Arizona. Specifically, we're in the Sonoida Elgin AVA, the first AVA in Arizona. And we have the privilege here today to be at Wilhelm, Wilhelm Vineyards, Wilhelm Family Vineyards. And this is Carol Wilhelm. Hi there. She's one of the two, I guess with many, uh, dogs and others included, that make up the family, that make up the wines, that make this a really special place to come visit. So, hello. Hi there. Good morning. How, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. As usual, we're keeping quite busy around here. I became a Wilhelm 26 years ago when I met Kevin in the uh, desert, uh, Saudi Arabia, of the first Gulf War in 1990. I was there flying as a paramedic in the back of an Air Force plane. Um, flying Aerovac, Air Medical Evacuation, and uh, he is an Air Force pilot. We proceeded to, uh, I continued to fly with the Air Force Reserves for a bit as a, as a paramedic and back, and he uh, continued to fly. He f has flown the F-16 for the last 25 years, uh, for the last 20 years here in Tucson. Before we get into the wine part of this, I just want to make sure we definitely tell you thank you to you and your husband for your service. So then, at some point, you decided to come down here. Yes, we, uh, we were in Oro Valley. Our kids were young. I was homeschooling them. Um, and my Colorado-born farm boy, which is really what he is. He's not the Top Gun, Tom Cruise type. He's a farm boy from Colorado. And we are Broncos fans. Uh, <laughs> um, said he needed a little more space. And so space equated to not having your neighbors 10 feet out this to window and that. And uh, we looked around quite a bit and we found this area. Uh, we liked the elevation of 5,000 feet. We liked the fact that there's mountains all the way around. We liked that there's seasons uh, to an extent in that the heat is moderate uh, with high desert. And uh, so we bought 20 acres. And after we bought 20 acres, we found out it was at the time the state's only AVA, American Viticultural Area, Viticulture Growing Wine Grapes. So your husband, he, he planted all these vines. And I have to say, when we drove in, this is one of the nicer looking vineyards. The vines themselves look quite healthy and uh, still looking like some of them have some fruit on them. They still do. Uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon, which is our latest ripener, uh, will go through another couple of weeks. I've been checking it regularly. Um, we actually did this as a family uh, affair as well. Uh, when we did get started, we started building we built this place pretty much ourselves. There are a few things we didn't do. Uh, we didn't pour the concrete. Um, inside we have stained, cord, uh, stained scored concrete, which we chose the color, and underneath that our um, radiant flooring is underneath, <laughs> underneath the concrete that we all applied ourselves. So we did that, and we also planted all of it ourselves. Um, I remember being out on the back of uh, the pickup, my sister Karen, who's here visiting right now and helping, would uh, run the levels. As a farm boy, you, uh, you get pretty particular about the grape stakes all being completely, completely straight. And so uh, you would be out there with post pounders on the back of either the quad or the uh, backhoe, and you would pound the grape stakes in. And, uh, and start running trellising lines. Uh, and then uh, we found that he's pretty good at running the shovel and I'm pretty good at planting. So um, again, it was a concerted effort. Um, and that was back in uh, 05. So 05, so when did you get your first yield that you were able to start bottling? 08. 08. 08, and we called that particular one Carol's Cuvée. Cuvée is a fancy French word for blend. And because Carol starts with a K, Cuvée also does on our wine bottle. Mm. And, uh, and it was a combination of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, so three big Bordeaux's, and then Syrah. So uh, it ended up being a really lovely combination, and, um, and that was a 08 vintage, and that was our first estate bottling. Wow. So since 2000, they're very cool. We, we can't miss this place. We enjoy coming here, the, these rolling hills. In the springtime, this is very green and monsoon season, of course. But then right now in the fall, there's these amber. It's just beautiful rolling hills until you see this beautiful vineyard on the hilltop. And there is this 
big structure, um, somewhat maybe Spanish architecture or whatever, something like this. And it's got this color that she likes to refer to as her butterscotch castle. That's true. So you can't miss it when you come here. Um, but when you come here, what type of wines are we going to be expecting to taste? And to, what well, do you like to make? I like to make um, I like to make wine that I feel people are going to find something they can enjoy. Uh, I joke around with folks in the tasting room and say it's a non-judging winery. Um, I uh, I tell them that even if they like uh, sweeter wines, I don't consider it training wheels. I tease them sometimes that it is, but. Um, my feeling is this, people feel very strongly about foods that they have. They might, they might get into a heated debate about whether Papa John's or Papa Murphy's or Pizza Hut is the better pizza, but many people are very um, intimidated by their presum presumptuous uncle, pretentious uh, someone in their life that tells them they must smell this and they must taste this and they must like this. And, uh, and so they feel uncomfortable about deciding what wines they like. And, uh, I want to have a place where I have something for everyone. And uh, the folks that come in and say, you know, I've actually liked everything that you have here. It's like, well, I'm okay with that. But what I'm even more okay with is that everyone who comes into my room, whether they prefer dry wines, whether they prefer semi-sweet, whether they prefer my port selection, they will find something that they can enjoy here. And so that's important. So non-judging winery. Um, if you're one of my sweeties, that's okay. Very cool. I think if you go to her website, you'll find it says, we have something that everyone should like. Someone, so, yeah. At least something. And well, the big, the big thing is um, uh, the bottom line, it doesn't matter. Uh, as far as the UC Davis certification, I was actually the first Arizona winemaker certified. So I'm certifiable now. Uh, the first certified <laughs> winemaker in, in, in Arizona. And they taught me a lot, and uh, most of it was book learning, a uh, voracious amount of reading. But that and another 30 years experience, I ought to be pretty good. But uh, it doesn't really matter <laughs> what I think about a, a bottle of wine, if this is my personal favorite. Because I will have people say, well, what do you like best? Well, that's like asking for your favorite child, right? That's just mm -hmm. un inappropriate, inappropriate, or your favorite dog. Mm -hmm. um, it, the bottom line is, do you like it? Yeah. What, what goes in the bottle? The proof is in the pouring. Yeah, yeah, I think Thomas Jefferson said the best one is the, the one that uh, the one you like. <laughs> the one you like. So we, uh, we're going to move inside and okay. we're going to show you some of the wines that she's making. She can talk about them. But before we do, I had a quick question. While we're filming this, I can't help but notice most of you might be hearing these birds in the background. And before we started filming, this question was posed and I thought the answer was remarkable. So what are we hearing out there? Is that, is that birds trying to get at your fruit? That, uh, that is us torturing birds. No. <laughs> um, the question was, are those live birds or, are those, um, or is that a recording? And the answer is yes, it's both. Um, there are a number of ways that you can combat uh, bird salvaging of your fruit because, of course, uh, if they're getting at it, it's uh, not being put into our wine. And as they're getting at it and picking at it, rot can start. So it's a problem. Um, with, with birds, na natural uh, animal, uh, bees, etc., trying to get at your fruit. There's a couple of things you can do. You can use a cannon, um, which goes off every couple of minutes. Your neighbors don't tend to like it very much. Um, the, you can use netting, which is also a bit of a problem because it's a lot of labor, manpower, to roll netting out and then roll it back as you harvest. The problem also is that the birds get caught, they get trapped, they die. Or you can do what we do, which is considered a bird guard. A bird guard is a company that will take your list of indigenous birds and record them in distress, and also your list of raptor predator birds um, and their calls, and put them all on a computer chip that we can broadcast throughout the several different speakers in the vineyard in order to frighten the birds off because it'll go off at intermittent intervals. So uh, we do set it to go off at night and come on at daylight. Um, so we don't hear the land of the lost at night while we're trying to sleep. <laughs> but uh, it, does, uh, it does a pretty effective job and it's obviously very humane. Um, the birds will come and alight and then that'll go off and they, they flutter off like, you know, oh, Uncle Bob's hurt, let's <laughs> leave. Uh, wondering what's gonna get them <laughs> next. So. That's our, uh, that's our bird torture that's going on, but it's actually hum very humane and not killing them and netting. Fantastic. 
All right, so we're going to move into the tasting room area and we're going to talk some more about the delicious nature and the different blends that we have here at Wilhelm. So we're here in the tasting room at Wilhelm and uh, we've got a lot of talk about, about regarding the wines, but first, um, you know, a lot of people ask, how do you uh, survive down here in the desert, the high desert, but how do you survive near Arizona? And uh, a lot of the time they ask about the question of water usage. And I think Carol had a wonderful answer, how they handle it. Well, it is, a, it is a confusing thing for many people. They think of Arizona as being what they saw Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner going through, like Yuma. At 5,000 feet, we're actually more high desert grasslands as opposed to all the cacti and sand everywhere and uh, as we said earlier it gets beautiful up here. Uh, people say we need to go down to Sonoida but actually you're going up to Sonoida. And uh, the water, uh, so wine grapes use the least water of any agricultural crop, the least water of any agricultural crop. So uh, when people see the grazing cattle around they're using a lot more water to drink especially if they're nursing uh, young. And uh, so the grapes are not really drinking that much water. In fact, they like to have dry feet, otherwise they could get things like a root rot. Um, but inside, wineries, to be fair, to be completely frank and transparent about it all, can use a whole lot of water. Um, and, and we don't use chemicals, uh, but we do have to use uh, steam, which uses less water and is a very uh, effective way to sanitize barrels as much as possible, but the bottom line is there's still water usage. So what Kevin and I decided back when we were building this place is to put in a, a, a drain, a grate that runs the length of our 130 foot long building um, that is on its own recapture water system. Um, so nothing in the living space that would be black water and maybe has detergents and things for our family usage because we do actually reside at our place. It makes for a great commute, like five steps, either into my tasting room or my winery. And uh, generally it's always a bring your dog to work day, so that's pretty amazing. Um, unfortunately, I never leave work, but, so what we decided to do is, is have this drain that recaptures every drop that I use in my winery and it all goes back out to my vines. So, yes, wineries use a lot of water, but it goes back out into the entire system. That's wonderful. That's great. So now we're to the, pro the part of the program where we talk about the finished product, where we talk about why people are going to drive down here and see and taste what awesome. you have to offer. Awesome. So where would you like to start? Well, we talked a little bit earlier about what do I make and what do I like, and I, my response is I like to make things that other people like. Um, and that being said, there's a couple of different major distinctions. You've got your dry wines, you've got your semi-sweet wines, and you've got your sweet wines. And I make all of them uh, with, with lots, of, uh, lots of variation. Uh, over here, this is a, a few of the ones that I've made over the years. I have some dry whites, I have dry reds, and of course dry just means not sweet. Um, a lot of education goes on every time people walk into the tasting room here, and, and uh, I really enjoy doing that as well. You know, someone will say, well, is this one drier than this dry? Well, dry just means not sweet, which means, is it zero? Is it less than zero? Well, there's no such thing. So what they often will think is dry wine is um, what gives them a drying sensation in their mouth. You know, who, who put the paper towel in my mouth? Well, that has to do with tannins and astringency. And so we talk about those things and we talk about potentially allergies with, with tannins and sulfites and so dry, not sweet. So whites and reds both, I run the gamut. We tend to specialize more in Spanish uh, whites. Currently we have a Spanish and a Portuguese white. We have Alabarino, which is kind of our flagship white. And we also have Verdelio, which is Portuguese, uh, similar flavor profiles but not your typical Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc that you'll see a lot in the U.S. I like to uh, introduce other wine varietals. There's over 7,000 Vitus vinifera, and uh, life is short, and so you should be able to try different things and not stick with the same. Especially when you're coming to a tasting. Exactly. Right? Well, you know, every now and then someone will come in and say, well, do you have Merlot or Chard? No. Well, I don't know if I want, it's in a tasting room. Go ahead and give it a try. I mean, right. these are the folks that probably order a cheeseburger at the new Thai restaurant, right? Yeah. So that's no, that's no fun at all. Right. So that being said, I will have folks who perhaps are new in their wine enjoyment or um, just prefer still the semi-sweet wines. 
So they will eschew the dry and that's okay. Every now and then I'll try and slip one in and see if we can expand their horizon, maybe get the training wheels off their wine glass a little bit. Certainly. <laughs> um, and I do tease them about that, so they don't, they don't mind if I say that. But because I do know I have folks that like sweeter wines, I also created a uh, sangria line. I've got a white peach, a more traditional red with orange and lime. And our newest one, who has become the star of the show of all of them right now, um, is Arriba. Arriba is my uh, prickly pear, passion fruit, jalapeno sangria. And so it's sweet at the front with a little jalapeno kick on the, on the end to suit your fiery side. And uh, sweet and dry alike, have been, I've been liking that one. Then if they move from the semi-sweet, well, the semi-sweet, I also have a port line. Um, and I actually have 14 of those. I have seven white and seven red. Um, again, we've got various flavors. We have the plain basic port, a white called Sunrise, a, a plain red, which is more of a tawny a sunset. And then from there, I do 100% natural additives and extracts, which all of my sangrias and my ports are all 100% natural. Uh, they're all low sulfite and they are all vegan friendly. But um, generally people will find something that they like, whether it's their chocolate caramel or whether it's the chocolate mint at Christmas time. Or The other thing that I have, which is, uh, is uh, quite popular and also semi-sweet, is something that comes out uh, during the winter, uh, October through March generally, and it's, uh, it's Glühwein. It's pronounced Glühwein. It is uh, uh, a German wine, German uh, wine which translates as glow wine. We opened in October of 08, and of course with the German name Wilhelm, uh, I had people come in and say, what German wines do you have? And I'd say, of course. Spanish and French, <laughs> because that's what grows well in our area. But I decided, uh, I'm actually Danish and, uh, and quite opinionated about things and explains more the blonde and blue and almost six feet. But uh, I thought, well, you know what? I don't have any German wines, but I can. And so I researched and found Glühwein, which means blow wine, like I said. And it is served at the Christmas markets, predominantly in Germany and Austria. And apparently it's called glow wine because as you're in a cold, blustery German Christmas market, you drink this stuff because it's warm and has cinnamon and cloves, you start glowing. So glow wine. So uh, we get a lot of folks who come in and say, I need, I need, that, I need that warm stuff, Carol. And so I know what they mean. And, and I did it uh, in uh, two bottle sets so it could either be with white or with red wine, um, as well as being able to heat the uh, mix separately so you don't A, lose your alcohol when you heat, and two, you don't denature the proteins, which makes it taste burnt. So um, along with giving someone they wanted as far as a German wine, I put some more math and thought and chemistry into it and separated them so that you don't get a burnt product, but uh, you still get a nice warm cinnamon and cloves mold wine. Very cool. Like another, a mold wine. another one of our line. Fantastic. So how would people get a hold of you if they were going to find out? When are you open? Well, uh, we, are, uh, we do have a website. It's wilhelmvineyards.com. We, uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Uh, we have a, a rather large newsletter list uh, with wine club membership. Um, we, uh, we disseminate information through all of those avenues. Uh, there are magazines that have that, but unfortunately we have found that those are not always uh, completely accurate. We uh, recently changed our hours to Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 4, and other times by appointment. Well, the magazine still says we're open daily. So any of you who have <laughs> shown up at my closed gate and said, but the magazine said, uh, my response is, first, I'm sorry, please come back, uh, or try and give me a call, and if I'm here, I will come out and I will open up and I will pour for you. I might not have been showered yet. I might be covered in <laughs> grape juice of some sort, um, but I will try my best. And, um, and uh, there's certain things that we can't control on the website, on Facebook and Instagram, Yelp, et cetera. We are 
accurate in our hours. Unfortunately, there's still literature out there that we don't have control over that still says the wrong things. Sure, you're busy, but it's very cool to be able to come out here and meet the actual growers, the actual winemaker and all that. And I want to thank you very much for a couple things. For bringing us here and allowing us to come and interview you, first of all. Thank you very you're much. You're very welcome. For my allowing pleasure. us to taste some wine, which is yeah, always the best part next. for me. But also, I wanted to reiterate uh, our appreciation of you and your husband both being in the military and providing us uh, the freedoms that we enjoy uh, through your service. We appreciate that very much. Well, he, uh, he continues to enjoy um, teaching other countries the F-16, and uh, at this point we're looking at what uh, our next endeavor for his career might be. Um, he is full-time my vineyard manager, and when uh, people come in and remark about how beautiful our vines is, our, I, I will say, quite honestly, I have an amazing vineyard manager. Um, outside, he's Hefe. Inside, I'm the winemaker. Uh, Hefe, perhaps. Um, Kevin is, uh, he does enjoy wine. He is not a winemaker. Um, he was asked right at the beginning, you know, I'm like, here, babe, try this, you know, and he says, wine <laughs> yes i do have a wine named after him it's called kevin's choice uh it is a tempranillo which grows very well in this area it's a spanish bridal from mm -hmm. the la rioja region which we're very similar in soil and climate to and i was a brand new winemaker and i um i was tasting and i was blending and i was using a little syringe because a syringe is a great way to measure I wasn't, I didn't have the needle, of course, since I was drinking, but luckily I was taking <laughs> copious notes because I would do a little bit and I would try it and I would take notes and I would, you know, sample and I wasn't spitting, to be honest. And he got home from work that day and I said, honey, I, I have it down to these two, <laughs> but I have palate fatigue. I did, but I was tipsy. <laughs> and he said, oh, is this what we call it? <laughs> And I said, yes, I have pal but, but I can't tell. You pick. The name of the wine is now Kevin's Choice and has when been for the picks. last six years. Very fun. Very fun. We, uh, well, thank you. As, as far as our service with military, we do, uh, we do also strongly believe in that and uh, are proud to have been able to serve. Uh, with that, we chose to do a couple of things. Uh, we have two different glasses, uh, the traditional wine glass with our logo. But we also have um, a, uh, a stemless glass, which is one of our most popular. And it has our logo on the one side, and it has our Patriot flag, Patriot salute flag on the other. Uh, we found that this is by far the most popular glass. It's versatile, uh, but it also represents. And uh, also with the Patriot flag stemless glass, we have a Patriot salute wine line. It's always a Zinfandel. Uh, we came out with the first, well, you're not going to see that, huh? Uh, we came out with the first one in 2010, and every year we have a different aircraft um, that represents our Patriot Salute line. It comes out November 11th, generally. Uh, one year, in 2016, we did a, uh, 2015, we did a B-17, which is actually at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and a portion of that bottle sales goes back to the museum to help support what oh, they're wonderful. trying to do out there with the 390th Bomb Group. Uh, the B-17 that's featured on that label is called I'll Be Around, and there's a little synopsis there on the side, but that's the right tail number and everything. That is that plane that sits in the Pima Air and Space Museum. So I'm proud of that, too. I'm proud of what we're doing with that, and uh, LEO and uh, military and stuff all get a 10% discount in my tasting room uh, frequently. They'll get complimentary tastings and things. Uh, that's wonderful. Nurse, uh, yeah, designated drivers. <laughs> Uh, we're always thanked and um, and nursing mothers who are tasting and pumping but then going back to nursing they often get complimented. <laughs> it's good to be the owner because I can do what I want. <laughs> It's very cool, and uh, we've had a yeah, wonderful time, and visit here was spectacular. Um, I, I also need to thank the group here responsible for bringing you this show. So everybody that's been involved in doing this Southern Arizona series, I want to thank. And I want to let you guys know, if you want to see these or any other episodes, you can simply go on PrescottMediaCenter.org forward slash wine 101 and it'll bring up a list of all the shows we've done so if you see any of them you should revisit or look at them but also definitely look at the one uh, for Wilhelm and all the ones down here in the Sonoida Elgin area um, 
And if you're driving down this way, because there's a lot to do, and you see this butterscotch colored castle off in the distance, it'll be, it'll be Wilhelm. But you won't see it unless you get on the road. <laughs>